So tonight what I want to do is move our attention away from the continent. We felt, uh, last week we de dealt a lot of time um, in France and we dealt a lot of time with, with, with the uh, European continent. Today, for a bit of a change and a bit of variety, I want to look at our theory and tales and how they represent the same sort of themes that we were looking at um, last week. In part, because Arthur, I think, is a sure winner when it comes to selling a course, right? Uh, most people seem to have a uh, particular love for, for Arthurian tales. Am I wrong about that? Anyone here like Arthur the Arthurian tales? Really? Okay. That's okay. Um, anyone here not really know what we're talking about? Anyone not familiar with the Arthurian tales? Anyone here doesn't like the Arthurian tales? And a whole bunch of ambivalence. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> This is going to change maybe some, of the, uh, maybe some of the tone of the lecture, because part of the reason why I want to use Arthurian tales is because, in a way, they are a much different way of looking at the themes of this course. Last week, we looked at histories, right? We looked at people like Ray Tours. We looked at the Libra story of Frank Coral. We looked at official standard histories as a way of trying to see how historians and elites defined and described where they came from. The Arthurian tales are not history. At the very best, as we'll see through this lecture and through the readings um, that we'll be discussing later tonight, the Arthurian tales at best are pseudo-history, and at worst, nothing more than fictionalized romances. Right? If anyone's here familiar, again, those of you who have taken medieval, medieval history, if you're familiar with the idea of the Chants on the Jest, the romances, things like Song of Roland, uh, those type of things, Arthur, the Arthurian cycle, falls in that same kind of theme. It is historical fiction, much the way that uh, Jack White's works um, much, uh, in the 80s, um, I'm trying to think, uh, Philip Gregory's work of uh, the Tudors in the Tudor dynasty, it's historical fiction. Uh, for those who have watched the Tudors, or have watched uh, the Borgias, the, the various TV shows, or the Vikings, right? Arthur fits more into that idea. And yet, even though it is historical fiction, and even though Arthur, as we'll see, is most likely never been, or at least the Arthur that we, that we looked at, was not a historical figure. It may have been, a, the, the historical Arthur may have been a local warlord, but the Arthur that we're looking at, the Arthur that comes to dominate the Round Table, and Lancelot, and Queen Guinevere, and all of that, is a complete fiction. He is completely made up. And yet, even though he's made up, even though he's a, he's a fiction himself, the fact is, it tells a lot not only about how historians of the 11th to 14th century saw the past, but also how they used Arthur as a way of understanding and describing their own times. In many ways, Arthur becomes a mirror for his contemporaries. And then one of the things that makes Arthur fascinating is the fact that Arthur changes. And so we look at the, so the original uh, Arthur, Gregory, uh, sorry, Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, a much different Arthur than the, that of Thomas Mallory's Mort d'Arthur, right? The point is that Arthur changes as he's needed to. And I think one of the things we discussed in the very first lecture was the idea that even in the 20th century, the notion of Arthur still had resonance, right? The idea of the mythic Arch, uh, Arthur that would come when England was at its most dire, when England needed a hero, most of all, Arthur would come out of Avalon with his nice little round table and save England. And this idea had resonance even as late as World War II. And so tonight that's what I kind of want to do, is to look at how Arthur, how these tales, this fictional history, is very much part of the same idea of building a national identity, at least certainly within England. Okay? So. Who is Arthur? I mean, historians have spent careers studying Arthur. Whole armies of academics have looked at Arthur as a literary figure, have looked at him as a historical figure, have looked at him as an archaeological figure. I mean, entire libraries have been written on Arthur. So I think it's really important then to decide or to determine where exactly Arthur comes from. And the fact is, Arthur as a person, if we take this, the, the mythical or legendary Arthur, and I think that's what we're really talking about tonight, if we take the legendary Arthur, Arthur supposedly lived around the time, uh, just as the last years of the Roman presence in England. That Arthur rises up as a, uh, as a Romano-British or a Briton fighting off against 
invading tribes as Rome continued its retreat from, uh, from England. And yet, this embodiment, the mythical king that seems to embody the very idea of the English nation, who's supposed to live around the 5th century, 5th or 6th century, does not actually appear in the sources until the 7th century, when Arthur and his 12 battles first appear in the story of Ritorum uh, of 830, written by uh, a guy by the name of Ninius. Ninius wrote, in 830, wrote a sort of a mis uh, miscellaneous collection of material relating mostly to Britain, right? So again, this was meant to be kind of a comprehensive history of, of, of Britain. Um, so it included things like a chronology in which the set, uh, six ages of the world were described, which is a, again, very common in these kind of compilations. You have sort of you know, the first age of the world, the second age, the third age, and of course there's the notion of Christian um, elements in that. Six ages leading to the seventh age, which will of course mean the return of Jesus, something very important to within Christian uh, context. A description of Britain itself, so geography, what it looked like, um, is, you know, the mountains, the forests, all that. Um, a history of the, of the Britons themselves from the pagan origins to the death of St. Cuthbert in 687, a life of St. Patrick, um, Arthurania, world genealogies, the whole works, right? This was meant to be encyclopedic in nature. So everything, anything, basically, anything that Ninnies could throw into a book, in it went. So chronologies, geography, history, fictions, narratives, novels, whatever. And it's in Ninnius that we first see the, con the, the, the character of Arthur as an historical actor. I think one of the things that becomes really important to understand Arthur, and certainly how Arthur becomes, um, I guess, created or constructed throughout this period, is the fact that Ninnius relied mostly on fables. That most of his history, his Historia Pretorum, really is mostly, again, a fictional account. Uh, legends uh, are interspersed throughout this work um, as if they are, of course, real. So you get a lot of sort of, again, legendary stories. And Arthur becomes part of those legends. And so while, on one hand, there may very well be an historical Arthur of some sort, some local powerful war chief that may have been sort of the historical template, the fact is, the Arthur that becomes so apparent in Ninnius and then paired through other works, it's very much part of Ninnius' effort in fables. Right? The idea of legends creating um, uh, national, sort of again, yeah, these fictions. Which poses that question again, I think the question I want to come back to is, does it really matter? Right? I mean, as modern 21st century people, does it matter? that histories have been made up with fables. Actually, I just suppose that now, and maybe it's something we can work through throughout this book. Does it matter? Does it matter knowing that if you were to read, if I assigned the uh, Nisus text, does it matter that it's mostly fable, that's mostly fiction? Passing past history? As a history person, you kind of want to And I think, no, I, I think that's an excellent answer. And, and trying to deal with a lot of this type of material, I think that's a fantastic answer. Some of the best question is based on reality anyway, so some of it has to be true. And so as a historian, it's kind of um, a good lesson in figuring out what could be true and what could be true. And also um, thinking about when it was written and who it was written by also plays a good role. Yeah, no, I think that, yeah, I think that's an excellent answer. I think histories like this, while not necessarily excellent representations of the history they're trying to tell, can be excellent representations of the time in which they were written and the yeah. ideals. So yeah. I think even if it's fantasy and we know it's fantasy, it still has historical value. Yeah, I think that's, and I'm really, anyone else before we move on? No. Like, I think there is some aspect that legends are or you can because on some level it's some person's truth. Okay, it's some person's truth. I think that's, I think that's excellent. Anyone else? The fact is, I think all of those are the right answers. 
And the reason being, I think, because when we look at history, it is all about context. That these fables, whether they're real or not, whether they're completely made up, is that they do come from an important context. Right? And so I'm really glad to actually see that this is the answers that I'm getting, I think, in, in many ways. And I pose that question because it's one of those questions that we need to answer when we look at something like uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth. His History of the Kings of Britain is no, another example of where history and fable and fiction are all sort of met, melt together, and it's really up to the historian and the reader to try to decide, one, if it's important, and if it is, how to make sense of what Geoffrey Monmouth is doing in his histories of King of Britain, most of his kings who never existed. Right? So good. Just, so just keep that question um, in mind. And so, Nisa's love of legends really much contributed to his historical accuracy. So again, on, on a straightforward, is it good history? No, it's really bad history because it's really inaccurate. And if I, got it, if I had an essay that was written as badly or as inaccurate as, uh, as it is, I would send it back to you to tell you to rewrite it because this is history, not English. But in Nidhi's account, um, there are some very important uh, themes that will come to play a much larger role. One of the first ones is the prophecy or the, I, the um, introduction of Ambrosius Aurelianus. Um, he is seen as, in many ways, not the, not so much, he's not so much a founder or, or, or an ancestor of Arthur, but in many ways seen as a victor or a champion of British identity. Um, according to some accounts, and depending again who, who you read and how you read them, uh, Ambrosius Aurelius was a victor at the Battle of Bayon Hill, in which Aurelius defeated an enemy army, I think the Saxons. Um, and the point is, so Ambrosius is represented as a sort of champion of British identity, again, of British pride, of British, um, almost of British nationalism. Ambrosius, the, at least the way that Ninius tells the story, again, is completely fictional and completely fanciful. But as I go through it, keep in mind some of the stories behind Arthur. And so according to Ninius, the legend is, is that Vortigern, uh, Vortigern here, name up here, um, who was seen as a British chief who fought against the Romans, uh, as, Romans were supposed, as Romans were invading the island, according to legend, Vortigern was one of the main opponents against uh, uh, the Romans. And so Vortigern was told uh, to build a citadel in a certain spot in Wales. And I think this is important because one of the things that we see about Arthur is the fact the Welsh connection, that Arthur is very much connected to Welsh um, culture, Welsh mythology, um, even Welsh politics. And so Vortigern was told to build a citadel on a certain spot in Wales, but wise men told him that it would not stand forever unless he sprinkled it with the blood of a fatherless boy. And so Vortigern was told, find basically an orphan, and kill the orphan and sprinkle the blood of the orphan all over the ground, and then the city will be permanent. Um, Vortigern, good to, you know, is all this, found such a boy who told him that two dragons, this boy, you know, found was found, who told Vortigern before he was killed that two dragons, one red, let's see, uh, white, and one white, lived in the lake uh, under, the, uh, under the place in two tents that were in two jars. The boy then prophesied that the red dragon, symbolizing the Britons, would drive the white dragon, symbolizing the Saxons, from the lake, which symbolized the world. In other words, the Britons would be the conquerors of the Saxons. The boy said he was called Ambrosius. Again, Ambrosius Aurelianus. As John Burroughs points out in uh, the background reads that I signed for for tonight, later writers would try to connect the victor of Baden Hill then with the fictional Arthur. And one of the things that becomes prevalent within Arthurian legend, within Arthurian tales, is this idea of the red and white dragon. On Thursday, one of the things that you'll be doing is looking at the prophecies of Merlin. Um, and you see all this sort of, again, this sort of LSD tripping that's going on. Um, you know, hedgehogs fighting badgers over a river in a barrel with a few, you know, the point is if it's, 
it looks like it seems like a great, great shift. But the point is, is that this sort of animalistic symbolism become is very prevalent. And of course, again, anyone familiar with uh, Arthurian uh, tales will recognize the importance of dragons within the Arthurian sort of family tree. Uther Pendragon. Right? If, if, even if you watched, as everyone should watch the show, even the show Merlin. Right? The whole point of having a dragon is, again, a, 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 whole, a throwback to the importance of dragons within the early Arthurian tales themselves. But in this case, the dragons are meant to stand, symbolize the Britons, who will be triumphant over the Saxons. So already we see, even as early as the Indians and some of these early tales, already that these, are th that these myths and these legends are being t connected and redeveloped within a political context, right? The idea that the Britons will defeat the Saxons. The other thing that Dinius tried to do, as with any good historian of his time, is they tried to prove that the Britons had a long and famous history, right? This, again, this idea that their past was ancient. It went back many, many generations, it went back many, many centuries, it went back many, many um, eons. Essentially, he was hoping to create a history that was comparable to both biblical peoples and that of the Greek and Romans. And we've already seen that sort of process um, developing last week. He tells legends of early invaders of Ireland and Scotland. Though the Irish arrived in pre-Christian times, the legends associated, associate the first arrival with biblical events. Uh, they were descendants of, Scythian prince, of a Scythian prince who had fled from the Egyptians after crossing the Red Sea. So again, the historical point is that the Irish, yes, the Irish did leave Ireland and come to uh, come to Ireland, uh, the, uh, uh, England. But for Nidius, it wasn't just simply good enough to see a migrating people. They are part again of this much larger, again, Christian sort of universal history. Right? Again, tying yourself, plugging the British into this sort of history, you know, this sort of God-approved history. Okay. Nidius also proposed to correlate events in Britain with those on the continent, partly to prove that Britain had, had as long a history as anyone. In other words, we're just like the Franks, we're just like the Goths, and we're just like everyone else. We have a long and venerable history. In Nidius' day, however, by 830, by the 9th century, Rome was pretty much a faded memory. You know, obviously, Rome didn't simply walk out and turn the lights off, as, as past historians have argued. Um, fact, but the fact is, is that the Roman, Roman culture, the Roman society, Roman life by the, 8th, by the 9th century very much was, in many ways, of course, a memory. That by 830 we cannot talk of a Roman England, certainly not anymore. But, even though this had been a memory, and even though the memory had been fading, in fact for Ninius, he had even forgotten that the British were part of, or even Roman citizens at one point. But it didn't stop him from trying to link British history with Roman history. For Ninius, the first inhabitants of Britain were Ninius's grandson, Brutus, who was driven from Italy because he accidentally killed his father. He, uh, and to give him a biblical connection, Ninius provided Brutus with, of course, a genealogy that goes all the way back to, in one way, he stands to where does Brutus actually, his you know, genealogy go all the way back to. In a sense, yes, no, right. So again, we're back to this taking, you know, classical, um, epic genealogies and sort of fusing them with uh, biblical genealogies. Right. So that's Aeneas. But the thing is, Aeneas, Arthur doesn't really make. He's not a main character. He appears, but he's not yet a central concept at this point. I think, as you move ahead, in a sense we're, going to, we're skipping a few centuries now. Ninius in 830, and now we're going to Jeremy Monmouth in the 12th century, so we're going about, about 300 years here. But, I think some really important things that have taken place. In many ways, Ninius's work is very much in the same sort of vein as the Carolingian and Merovingian works that we looked at last week. Right, Congress of histories, uh, collection of stories, sort of the deeds. Jeffrey of Monmouth, it is a little different. In some ways, yes, again, very similar to the history of the kings of Britain, and so um, 
it's pretty much just a, a biography of all these different kings that, that, Jeff, uh, that Jeffrey uses. Um, but in some ways, Jeffrey's doing something very different, or at least is at the beginning of something different in European culture. And one of those things is the notion of romance history. And again, this goes back to what I mentioned at the very beginning. What I mean by romance history are the, Ro uh, the chivalric tales that we start seeing in this period. Things like the Song of Roland, um, the Cid, for example, the poems of, of the Cid, um, the, saga, the, the uh, Song of William, all these sorts of tales that are, in a sense, are versions of fictional history. They're, they're, they're historical fictions. But they become really important. One, because they're extremely popular. People, or at least the nobility, loved these shots on the jest. They loved the idea of heroic deeds, of knights uh, charging on their steeds, you know, facing down casts of thousands. Right? In the Song of Roland, Roland the hero is battling thousands of Saracens. At the very end, you know, his, his, his army has been ambushed by Saracens at, at just out of uh, um, and he's outnumbered, pretty much 2001 type of thing, right? This sort of, again, sort of Michael Bay, um, Jerry Bruckheimer kind of scenario. You can almost imagine the, you know, epic music playing, um, probably something from Celine Dion, and it's sort of screaming at you. And, you know, beyond, and, and there's, you know, Roland sort of swinging his axe and his sword, you know, knocking back his heads in until his head dashed in, his brains going, you know, you know dashed in on his head. That doesn't stop him, no, not Roland, because he's a hero. Right? And so, brains everywhere, but that doesn't stop him. He's still smashing until finally he dies heroically with a great speech. And you see why this is very popular. Um, and so, Jeffrey then does much to feed and sharpen an existing appetite. People, again, people love these stories, and so what Jeffrey does? Well, what do you do if you're an author? If anyone's ever tried to read a book, what do you want your book to do? Sell. You want to sell. And so how do you get your book to sell? How do you get whatever it is that you want to sell? How do you get it to sell? You market to your audience. You market, you, you market in a way that people want to buy it. And so Jeffrey essentially tapped into a market. He understood that his market wanted romance history, he wanted historical fiction, and he gave them exactly that. And so Arthur and his knights become central to the emerging ethos of chivalry. Right, the idea of this new, this new concept that we start seeing in the Middle Ages, that of chivalry, of courtly behavior based on an ethical code. Um, you know, the idea of you know, knights in shining armor, helping protect damsels in distress, that sort of thing, even though it's often the knights in shining armor that puts damsels into the stress. But the fact is, at least in theory, the knights do all the, you know, they, they're polite and they're courteous. And do all these sorts of things. And so, Jeffrey then starts, in a sense, filling or fueling this idea. He also adds a number of sub legends worked up both in France um, and Germany uh, to and, and to, in order to inspire the creation of medieval orders of chivalry which ate Arthur's Round Table. And in fact, medieval kings all the way up to Henry VIII, who was, you know, in many ways, not a medieval king took from Arthur and maintained some of these ideas, these chivalric orders, um, some of which still exist. Um, anyone here familiar with any, like, say, the Order of Bath? Or the Knights of the Garter? Right, these things still exist. Um, the Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II is still the head of the Order of the Garter. And it's still bestowed. Um, the Order of the Garter goes back to Edward III. In a sense, it was sort of playing at this idea of creating a chivalrous, a brotherhood of knights, a fraternity. Uh, 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 of knights. And Jeffrey Monmouth then has a, a major role in that. Even in the 16th century, one of the things that we'll see on Thursday um, as part of the class assignment is that in the 16th century, Arthurian prototypes were a cult at the Tudor court. The Tudors couldn't get enough of Arthurian ideas and Arthurian, uh, Arthurian themes. The Tudors were sometimes subconsciously Welsh, and that's, I think, one of the things to remember. The man that killed Richard III at the Battle of Bosworth, Henry Tudor, who becomes Henry VII, was a Welshman. And of course, Arthur, we'll go back to Ninius, Arthur himself is connected to the Welsh. And so for Henry VII, Arthur isn't just a mythic, heroic British king, he is also a Welsh. He's a Welshman, just like Henry VII. There's that connection. Um, and uh, Henry VIII, 
also extremely connected to that idea. Yes? Sorry, would that explain why Henry VII's oldest son was named Arthur Guy? That's exactly. That explains the fact that was excellent, you read my mind, that's my next point. That explains exactly why Henry's brother was Arthur. Um, and for a brief moment, we almost had, England almost had a, king, a real King Arthur. Yes, Henry VII had two, uh, two, at least two sons, the oldest was Ar uh, Arthur, who married uh, Catherine of Aragon, but Arthur died before he could inherit the, th inherit the throne, um, which then meant Henry VIII married Catherine of Aragon, which is the oldest of the horse. Um, but the fact is, yes, Henry, t Henry, t Henry Tudor, Henry VII, was self-consciously aware of playing with Arthurian themes. And yes, that played to, even into the idea of naming his oldest child Arthur, in order to establish a King Arthur. In part, not just because Henry VII was a fanboy of, of Arthurian tales, but also for a very political and a very important faction, because by directly tying himself to the, or to, to the mythical King Arthur, it secured and stabilized um, Henry VII's claim to the English throne, which was extremely weak. After all, he comes to the throne as a usurper and as killer of Richard III, although ha who had its own problems, but still seen as a legitimate, rightly anointed king. And so Henry VII had to play very, very tight on these type of these type of issues. Any other questions? Does that does that answer the question? Oh yes. It's, I think, first of all, there's not much that we know on Geoffrey himself. I know often it's good to get as much information on the author as possible. But the problem is we don't actually have much information on Geoffrey himself. On uh, comes of, of Monmouth, which suggests that he comes from the area of Monmouth, and at this point there's really no reason to doubt that. Um, Geoffrey may you know most likely it's telling the truth. Um, he also is apparent as you read his work that he disliked the Welsh and expressed approval of the Bretons, perhaps because he was a Breton by birth. And for those who may not be aware, a Breton comes from the coast of France. Um, and one of the things that we will see in Geoffrey is again, this idea of playing off on these sort of national identities. Because according to legend, does anyone, everyone knows the region of Brittany in France, right? Sort of near, you know, on the, on the Atlantic coast, it's, it's right near Normandy. In fact, it depends on where you are, you know, either in Brittany or Normandy fight over that idea. Um, does anyone know why it's called Brittany? Because Britons moved there. Supposedly named after uh, exiles of Brit Britons who left during the Saxon invasions. And so it's named Brit Brittany after the Britons who of course originally from Britain. It's one of those very neat things. Um, in fact, Brittany doesn't become part of France until the 16th century. So in many ways, it, you know, it sees itself. In fact, in many ways, it still sees itself as a sort of a, its own sort of unique um, jurisdiction. If you will. So, um, became a bishop in 1152 and dies around 1154. That's all we really need to know about Geoffrey. But what I think is more important, whether you know whether he died in uh, 1154 or not is that he probably wrote the Historia Regnum Britannae of the History of the Kingdom of Britain around 1136. And again, it is this legendary history of the Britons from prehistoric times until the late 7th century. So again, in a way, it's meant to be seen as a sort of a universal history. Right, so all the way back to prehistoric times, right to the 7th century. It was very popular, as I mentioned, it was a bestseller of the day, both in England and abroad. So this wasn't just seen as sort of a, a little, you know, sort of a little England type of literature. It was extremely popular um, in England, both on, in, uh, on the continent. There are almost 200 medieval manuscripts that are known to survive, which suggests again its popularity, um, because that many manuscripts survived from this period indicates there were a lot of manuscripts. Right. So again, just a sense of just how popular it was. And the fact is that Geoffrey's work as fictionalized as it is, as made up as it is, was extremely influential. Later stories would use Jeffrey's work as part of their own research base. From the 12th to 16th centuries, history of the ancient Britons, excuse me, 
was a generally, though not universally ex accepted authority. In other words, Jeffrey was the textbook you went to. If, you know, if, if this was a, you know, we trans you know, transported ourselves back in time to, uh, say, 1355, Jeffrey Monmouth would be the central text of this course because that's how influential he was. <coughs> the vernacular versions, the ones that were written in English and French, uh, were the stock from which grew numerous chronicles. So in other words, not only did his, uh, Jeffrey's work uh, represent um, sort of the history of the day, but again, many of the, some of the later chronicles, the later Charles and the Jest epics, are in fact based on Jeffrey's work. Right? So in many ways, it's sort of an important um, uh, source base. I don't think we can overestimate the importance of Jeffrey's work um, within, within the development, at least certainly within the medieval England. One of the reasons why I think, and just I think a really basic reason why it became really important or really popular was the fact that it's entertaining. It's a good read. Um, from start to finish, Jeffrey, whatever his lack and deficiencies as an historian or scholar were, the fact was Jeffrey was a good writer. He was, a, he was an extremely good writer, knew how to write a really good story. And let's face it, in the end, we're all really interested in really good stories even as, as competent historians. Historians who can tell a story better than someone else is often a more popular one, right? That's why complex histories do so well, at least in chapters. But no matter what we want to say, Jeffrey was a romance writer masquerading as a history writer. The fact is, that's how we have to see Jeffrey, is that he's a romancer, not a historian. And no historian today would object to him if he had avowedly written a historical novel. If he said, look, this history of the King of Britain is, you know, it's just my idea. I've got some really great ideas. I'm going to do some fictional, you know, sort of legendary sort of things. And we say, you know what? Cool. Great. Good storytelling. Love it. Um, it's like, say, Sir Walter Scott, right? For those who have read, say, you know, a thing like Ivanhoe, for example. Good historical novel. Or even, say, like some, someone like Thomas Mallory, who definitely fictionalizes the Arthurian tales. But to the contrary, Jeffrey pretended to write a history. In fact, he, did, he was very specific and explicit about the fact that what he was writing was, in fact, a history. That this wasn't meant to be fictionalized, this wasn't an epic, this was, in fact, real history. And this is the problem, right, is that for serious historians, it drives us a little insane. Because it's very hard to unravel. Well, in some ways it's not. There's a lot of things that are actually quite easy not to, un uh, to unravel. But some of the things when we start to get into some of the kings that, or names that we sort of do know, it does become more difficult to unravel what's the fiction and what's history and what actually, what actually happened. He begins like Bede or William, uh, William of Malmesbury, who was a historian at the same time, and whose works he knew. By stating his authorities. So, again, like any supposedly good historian, you state your authorities. I'm citing so and so. So, I'm getting my material from Bede, I'm getting it from William Malmesbury, I'm getting it from all these sources, which shows that I'm credible. Right? This is why even today we cite our sources. When you write an essay, it's all about citing your sources. And so, Jeffrey's like, see, I'm a good historian. Footnotes. It must be real. There's a footnote. Right? He also claimed that he used oral tradition, which in the Middle Ages was, of course, an acceptable source, um, and, a, and a certain very old book written in the British language. So Jeffrey's sources were sources that were recognizable, things like Bede or William Malmesbury, uh, oral histories, which were at the time seen as acceptable, um, and a very old book written in the British language. Now, that doesn't sound like the premise of a uh, Dan Brown novel. I don't know what does. You know, some, you know, some poor historians searching through a library, doing some research on some obscure thing, comes across an old book in the British language. This very old book, this very old book that was written in the British language that was given to him by Walter, the Archdeacon of Oxford, is in fact most likely nothing more than Jeffrey's imagination. In other words, Jeffrey made it up. Um, in a way, Jeffrey Mullins is a much better Dan Brown. According to Jeffrey, this book attractively composed to form a consecutive 
and orderly narrative set out all the deeds of these men from Brutus, the first king of, of the Britons, down to Cadwalder, the son of Cadwallo, and at Walter's request, I have taken the trouble to translate the book into Latin. And like I said, this book probably never actually existed. It's a fictional, made-up source. Geoffrey probably did no more than borrow from earlier histories, such as uh, Gildas, Ninius, Bede, William Malmesbury, um, and all these other guys. Some of these authorities, probably from oral tradition, but also mostly from his own imagination. The histories of the King of Britain is really a work of Geoffrey's own mind, and yet it holds still incredible value to us, as, as we'll see. Gildas, who I just mentioned as one of the sources of, um, at least one of the sources that Geoffrey tend to use, is important because in many ways Gildas was a Briton. He wrote, as you can see, that he lived around the fifth century. He wrote probably one of the first histories of Britain, post-Roman Britain. That is the ruin and conquest of Britain. And so Gildas, who Arthur does not appear in Gildas, but in many ways Gildas begins this sort of tradition of writing a British narrative. This is a neat tidbit, and I think this is, for those who are interested in Shakespeare, um, it is Geoffrey Monmouth who gives the first account of King Lear. There's no, again, historically there was no King Lear. Um, but the fact is, uh, Geoffrey Monmouth is the first one to, to sort of introduce the, introduce the idea of the character of King Lear, which of course for Shakespearean fans know, of course, as one of Shakespeare's greatest plays, is of course King Lear. To be fair to Geoffrey, after all, we've just now you know, disparage his good name, we have wrecked it through the mud. Geoffrey wasn't all wrong. And even though some of his work, you know, a lot of it is fictional, uh, he got some of it right. And the point is, is that we see this. Um, Geoffrey was the first, of course, to write an elaborate Arthurian legend. And the prophecies of Merlin seem to have been worked up by Geoffrey from the Ambrose legend in India. So again, that if we go back to that first slide of, again, this medieval manuscript of um, what we see in Ninius, the red and white dragon, which is simply seen basically as, again, a British versus Saxon struggle. Great, uh, Geoffrey Monmouth takes this and works it into this much larger and comprehensive idea of a prophecy um, that can be used. In many ways, much as Nostradamus' prophecies can be used. Right? They're so vague, so weird, that they can, they can be twisted to mean just about anything. And it's Jeffrey who gives us the, a lot of this. But the fact is, no matter how fictional, shreds of history do come in. For example, he states that the stones of, uh, stones of Stonehenge were brought in from Ireland. And so the point of Stonehenge is built by Irish stone. Um, even though that's not really the case, modern science has shown that the stones of Stonehenge came from the Press County Mountains in Pembrokeshire. And so while Jeffrey may have got, uh, got his exact location wrong, the fact is he was right about the fact that these stones were transported from a very, uh, from a much further distance than, than uh, South of England. And again, he tells how, in another story, how the Britons decapitated a Roman legion um, by the Walbrook River in London. Modern archaeologists have dug up a number of human skulls from the Walbrook. Uh, possibly Geoffrey here too incorporated an ancient uh, tradition of slaughter. In other words, that the story that Geoffrey tells of the slaughter of a Roman legion, a uh, legion at uh, Walbrook River, may in fact have been a, ref a reference to an historical event. So again, this idea that Geoffrey's history isn't all wrong. But again, most of it is his imagination. But this is the point, and I'm going to do the, sort of finish off this slide, um, we'll take a break and we'll come back to it, because in a way this sort of represents a natural break in, the, in what I want to do with this lecture.